So I'm going to talk about uh, cleft palate, certain principles and uh, certain surgical steps and the few basic techniques that are used in the repair of a cleft palate. Now the rule of 10 of Millard, we know it applies to cleft lip, but as far as cleft palate is concerned, the usual time period is around 9 to 12 months for the repair. Nowadays an earlier repair is advocated around 9 to 10 months so that the uh, speech of the child develops well. <clears throat> Again, the child should be of adequate weight and it is considered around 10 kgs and at least a minimum 10 of hemoglobin of gram per deciliter is required. Now a cleft palate is also a layered repair. There is a three layered repair. The mucoperiosteal flaps that are raised are of the palate, that is the oral lining. Now the creation of the levator sling, which is the muscle repair, is very important. So the levator muscle that uh, inserts and forms the levator aponeurosis in a palate is somewhat like this. So this is your palate, it's uh, the head uh, view of the skull. So the levator aponeurosis that comes and inserts, it gets inserted and it forms a sling in this level. But what happens is that if there is a cleft, there is a gap in the palate over here, instead of the aponeurosis crisscrossing in the center and forming like a hammock, like a sling, it will go along the margins of the cleft palate and it will not form this sling. So the repair of this levator sling is very, very important for the mobility of the palate, which in turn affects the speech. And finally, the third layer, which is the nasal layer, is very important. This is where most commonly the fistulas are formed and the regurgitation occurs. Now surgically the important points are that dissection should always be done under magnification. Dr. Somaland advocates that everything should be done under the microscope, but a minimum loop magnification is definitely required. Now in cases of nasal layer where sometimes in cases of wide palates where the closure is difficult with the available tissue, vomerine flaps can be raised and these flaps can be used to repair the nasal layer. Now the, we know that the flaps are based on the greater palatine vessels which are uh, coming from the palatine vessels that come from the maxillary artery and they rise through the greater palatine foramen. So what you can do is in order to achieve more mobility, you can island your flaps on these greater palatine vessels which has to be done under magnification. And uh, ultimately, old uh, times they used to uh, say that you can infracture the hamulus. Now the hamulus is the point where the tensor villi palatini takes a turn and it comes and gets attached to the levator aponeurosis. So previously they used to say if you infracture the hamulus, you relieve the tension on that area and you can gain mobility, but not everybody advocates that. And once you've done your repair on table, you have to check for the watertight closure. Now how do you check for this? So after the child has been intubated, you know that you have a ray tube that is used for it and uh, you have a mouth gag and all those surgical steps are important. So ultimately before extubating, you have to ask the anesthetist to uh, press on the, uh, to ventilate the patient. And once they ventilate the patient, you have to look that if any air bubbles are forming in that area and you have to assess for your watertight closure. Also at that time, once they ventilate, you should be able to see the mobility of the palate which has been repaired. So the two most common techniques that are used and you are definitely going to be asked in your theory or in your practical for a cleft palate repair. So the first one is the von Langenbeck repair. Now von Langenbeck described the uh, bipedical flaps. So this is a simple diagram showing the palate and the cleft. So what uh, von Langenbach advocated was to make relaxing incisions on the sides of the palate and pairing incisions along the cleft. So how would you make this is that along the cleft margins you have to make these pairing incisions. Don't forget these incisions and once you start the incisions on the along the alveolar process Usually they'll ask from where do you start anterior or posterior. So usually because of the dexterity of the hand, you're supposed to say you'll start from the posterior side. So you go as far as the maxillary tuberosity and this is the point where the greater palatine foramen lies. It's uh, usually opposite to the upper maxillary third molar. So once you start your relaxing incisions, they will go all the way along from here. And similarly on the other side as well and it will be bipedical because these two points anteriorly and posteriorly will not be elevated 
and then the flaps will be raised that is the mucoperiosteal flaps will be first raised for the oral lining so this will create a raw area over here and you will have the flaps raised from here so this is where the raw areas will be created similarly on this side and this side so here these are the lateral raw areas and these are the flaps that will be created so now these two flaps will be moved in these directions these are the lateral relaxing incisions and these are the pairing incisions so ultimately the closure that you will obtain will be in this manner so for the closure you'll have a midline one where the suture line will be there you have a three layered closure once the muscle dissection has been done nasal lining has been repaired so from inside to out the repair has been done this is the final suture line that will lie in the midline up till the uvula and these will be the lateral raw areas now most of the times these lateral raw areas are just left to heal on its own only in cases where the cleft is very narrow sometimes the repair of these could be possible but otherwise they are just left to heal on their own or you can put gel foam or some packing material to decrease the oozing now there's a modification of von Langenbach technique which is the Burdack modification what Burdack advocated is that in certain cases where the clefts are wide and as much mobility may not be obtained these flaps can be converted into unipedical ones so this flap will be extended in these two directions and it will be elevated anteriorly as well so ultimately you'll get one flap elevated here another flap elevated here and then they will be brought into the midline and closed but ultimately the lateral raw areas will remain so this is a commonly used technique another technique that is used is the vy pushback or the view water waddle and kilner vwk technique now in this technique similarly up to the maxillary tuberosity until the greater palatine foramen you make your lateral incisions but this incision comes and meets here in the midline where the cleft lies it forming the v shape hence and similarly extend onto the other side and again these pairing incisions which will again come and meet at the level of the cleft now because of this incision the v incision or w incision and there is a pushback involved so in this cases the flaps will not move towards the center medially but they will have a backward movement so ultimately what you will get will again after the three layered closure be a central suture line and then what you will get are the raw areas that will be something like this actually these will they will be longer they will be till where you have extended your primary incision but this is what it will look like now the raw areas are bigger as compared to the von Langenbach technique and some people say because of the pushback that is involved there is more fibrosis in the palate and that actually affects the mobility of the soft palate as well as the final speech so some people don't prefer this uh, so again I have seen most commonly the von Langenbach technique but this is one more technique that can be asked in your examination and there is another technique which is of historical importance which is the Dorian's technique it's a horseshoe technique and that what will happen is that from here to here completely along the alveolar process a complete incision will be made and pairing incisions will be made along the cleft so a complete horseshoe shaped flap will be raised and it will be used to close the midline so these are the most common techniques that are used uh, the one that is used for those double opposing z plasty for the palatoplasty i'll explain in the next video